it's uh, 1.02 p.m. Uh, and I will ask Doug Remedios to call a roll. Commissioners, if you'd open your, your microphone so that Doug can call a roll. Commissioner Alvarado. Yes, sir. I was muted. Commissioner Burke. Commissioner Dunn. Present. Commissioner Gardino. Present. Commissioner Inman. Here. Commissioner Kehoe. Here. Commissioner Liu. Here. Commissioner Norton. Present. Commissioner Tavaloni. Here. Commissioner Chair Ben Kinnever. I'm here. Senator Member Bell. I'm sorry, Senator Bell. Assemblymember Frazier. Chair, we have a quorum. Thank you, Doug. The CTC exists to make transportation planning, funding, and policy more understandable and accountable. Our meetings normally take place in diverse locations around the state so that commissioners can see firsthand the variety of infrastructure issues around California. This meeting had originally been scheduled to be in Santa Barbara. However, due to containment measures surrounding COVID-19, it has required us to make an adjustment up to a webinar format. We are working to reschedule our meeting to Santa Mar in Santa Barbara. Please practice grace and empathy today. Everyone's doing their best to make the, um, make the best out of a very difficult situation. The Commission's uh, meetings agenda is located under hand the handout tab and can be downloaded and saved during the webinar. It can also be found at the Commission's website. If you're experiencing any technical issues with the GoToWebinar system, please contact the organizer through the questions tab or via the CTC webinar email address shown on the screen. To my commissioners, fellow commissioners, should commissioners have any questions or comments during the meeting, please select the raised hand tab at the right hand side of your screen. You can also send inquiries through the questions tab so that they can be read to the audience on your behalf. I will do my best to call on each of you in turn. Because this meeting is not an in-person meeting, each vote will be a roll call vote. That means that when it comes time for a vote, please open your microphones so that we can do the roll call vote as expeditiously as possible. possible. A commissioner can only speak when called upon by the chair. When I call upon you, please state your name for the record and, and make your point. I would please ask that no one speak a second time on any one motion until everyone who wishes to speak uh, a first time has done so. To our presenters today, if you're on the agenda to make a presentation before the commission, please do your best to be succinct. We have 115 items to get through today. To the public, we welcome your comments today. For participants joining us through the Go to Meeting webinar system, please find the webinar panel located on the right hand side of your screen. There you will find the audio questions and handout tabs. Under the audio tab, attendees will have the choice to select either computer or telephone option. Should you prefer a computer audio, please ensure the box is selected as this is the Go to Webinar system's automatic se setting. If you choose the phone call option, select the corresponding box and dial the number, access code, and audio pin as directed by the automated system. Please note that if the audio pin is not entered, then you will remain in listen-only mode and will be unable to speak to the audience should you have a comment. As a reminder, each registered attendee is provided with a unique link and phone number to access the webinar. 
These cannot be shared with other participants as they are registered to a specific attendee. Should you have comments pertaining to an item on the agenda, send it through the questions tab for the commission staff to read on your behalf, or select the hand icon to be unmuted. Please be sure to state your name and agency prior to voicing your remarks. Once again, the Commission's meeting agenda and webinar instruction guide are located under the handouts tab and can be downloaded and saved during this webinar. You can also go always go to the Commission's website. I would ask the general public to please do your best to be concise with your comments. Please also make sure that your comments before the Commission add new information. If you agree with comments of a previous speaker, please simply state that. Since we may have many speakers, we ask that you uh, make your point in, less, in three minutes or less. If for some reason we have a lot of speakers on a to topic, I reserve the right to limit comments to one minute. So at this time, I will move to item two on the agenda, resolution of necessity. Terry Anderson, please. Thank you. The Commission scheduled this condemnation appearance at the request of the Hubbard Law Firm that represents the property owners. This appearance relates to impacts to the owner's property caused by a $13.6 million project on State Route 18 in San Bernardino County. The project proposes to construct a raised curb median and widened portion of the existing roadway. Under eminent domain law, a property owner whose property is under condemnation consideration has the right to appear before the commission to question three issues. Number one, does public interest and necessity require the proposed project? Number two, is the project planned and located in a manner that will be most compatible with the greatest public good and least private injury? Three, is the, pro is the property necessary for the proposed project? The Commission neither determines the amount of compensation for the property rights to be acquired, nor deals with any issue other than the three state. Government Code Section 7267.2 requires the Department to make an offer to purchase the property rights needed. The Department has made the required offer. Code of Civil Procedures Sections, Section 1245.240 specifies eight affirmative votes for commission approval of a resolution of necessity. The property owner's objections are included in the attachments to the book item. Um, I guess I would ask now if there is anyone on the webinar, either the property owners or um, their representatives. If maybe you should raise your hand. There's no public comment this time. Okay, thank you. Um, commission staff has reviewed the objections, the property owner's objections, and the department's responses, and recommends the commission approve the resolution of necessity. The chair will entertain a motion. Commissioner Tavaloni, would you like to make a motion? Move it. Do I have a second? Mr. Norton, second. Thank you. Is there any discussion? There's no public comment. Seeing no discussion, I'll call, uh, Doug, please call the roll. Commissioner Alvarado. Yes. Commissioner Burke. Commissioner Dunn. Aye. Commissioner Gardino. Aye. Commissioner Inman. Aye. Commissioner Kehoe. Aye. Commissioner Liu. Aye. Commissioner Norton. Aye. Commissioner Tavaloni. Aye. Commissioner Chairman Commander. Aye. The motion passes. Thank you. Item three, Terry Anderson. Yes. Uh, commissioners, the commission scheduled this condemnation appearance at the request of the Shepherd Mullen firm that represents the property owners. 
This appearance relates to impacts to the owner's property caused by a $176 million project on Interstate 5 in Orange County. The project proposes to construct one general purpose lane in each direction. Other operational improvements are proposed for the corridor. Under eminent domain law, property owner whose property is under condemnation consideration has the right to appear before the commission to question three issues. One, does public interest and necessity require the proposed project? Is the proposed project planned? Can I just call with you so that you can try to vote next time? Is, is the project okay. planned and located in a manner that would be most compatible with the greatest public good and least private injury? Three, is the property necessary for the proposed project? The commission neither determines the amount of compensation for the property rights to be acquired nor deals with any issue other than the three just stated. The department has made the required offer. Um, the property owner's objections are included in the attachments to the book item. Staff has reviewed the objections and the department's responses and would recommend the commission approve the resolution of necessity. I guess I should have asked, is there anyone from either the Shepherd Mullen firm or the property owners on the webinar? At this time, we don't see any questions or comments or anyone indicating from the Shepherd Mullen on the line. So at this time, I'd entertain a motion. Mr. Chair, Lucy, Lucy Dunn moves the item. Thank you. Do I have a second? Seeing that Joe. Two, thank you, Joe. Uh, discussion. Is there any discussion? No, there's no discussion at this time. We do not see any discussion this time. I'll call, uh, Doug, please call the roll. Commissioner Alvarado. Aye. Commissioner Burke. Commissioner Dunn. Aye. Commissioner Gardino. Aye. Commissioner Inman. Aye. Commissioner Kehoe. Aye. Commissioner Liu. Aye. Commissioner Norton. Aye. Commissioner Tavaloni. Aye. Chair Van Denenberg. Aye. Chair, the motion passes. Thank you. Item four, Terry Anderson. The commission scheduled this condemnation appearance at the request Hello, of the Neumeyer Dillon firm that represents Hello. the property owner. Again, I asked if, if either the um, rep representatives or okay, the so are on your screen up in the, up in the right corner. Yeah. Go ahead, keep going, Terry. We're having some technical issues here. Keep going. Keep going, Terry. Sorry, I'm sorry. Okay. This appearance relates to impacts to the owner's property caused by a $3.6 million project on State Route 1 in Orange County. The purpose of the project is to remove and replace a 100-year-old box culvert that carries the Laguna Canyon Channel under Highway 1 in the city of Laguna Beach. Under eminent domain law, a property owner whose property is under condemnation consideration has the right to appear before the commission to question three issues. Does public interest and necessity require a proposed project? Is the project planned and located in a manner that will be most compatible with the greatest public good and least private injury? Is the property necessary for the proposed project? The commission neither determines the amount of compensation for the property rights to be acquired or deals with any issue other than the three just stated. Um, Government Code 7267.2 requires the department to make an offer to purchase the property rights stated and the department has made the required offer. The property owner's objections are included in the attachments to the book item. Additionally, a letter the commission received this week from the property owner's representative was included in your handouts for today. Staff has reviewed the objections and the department's responses and recommends the commission approve the resolution of necessity. Mr. Chair, I remove, I move approval. This is Commissioner Inman. Thank you. And this is Bill Lou. I will second. Thank you. There's been a motion and a second. Is there any public comment and is there anyone from the law firm uh, representing the property owner who has submitted any questions or comments? 
Uh, we do have a, a common request from a Charles Krolikowski. Okay, let's go ahead and hear it. Charles, you are now muted and free to speak. Hello, can you hear me? We can. Yeah. Okay, yes. Um, yeah, my name is uh, Chuck Krolikowski. I represent the ownership uh, of the property as well as the operator of the gas station and the convenience store. And I've submitted two letters, which I know you have already, but I wanted to kind of go over three items today. Um, one is, I know the staff discussed the three resolution items, but actually under the eminent domain law, the fourth one does include the government code sections related to making the offer. Uh, in addition to that, uh, the government is required by law, or count friends in this case, to actually negotiate uh, with the owner in good faith prior to even moving for a resolution assessment. Uh, when we received the offer last year, uh, we worked hard with uh, Caltrans Legal Counsel and we came up with a response. We provided financial data and in project information and provided that to Caltrans uh, about a month ago um, at their request to try to negotiate the acquisition in lieu of proceeding with condemnation. Uh, we provided that response to Caltrans, and after since we uh, since we provided that, we have heard nothing. I followed up, and I still heard nothing. So, in addition to making an offer, incumbent in that is also negotiating good faith, which I believe Caltrans has failed to do with respect to this acquisition. Uh, and the domain is supposed to be the last resort, and by law, there is a requirement that they attempt to negotiate good faith, which did not happen here. That's point, that's point number one. Uh, point number two is the elements of whether the project is planned in a manner that is for the greatest public good and the least private injury. Uh, for this property, which is right at the corner of PCH and Broadway, a very critical intersection um, for the business operation, it has three driveways. Uh, during project construction, two of those driveways will be impacted substantially. One will be closed altogether. The other one will be mostly closed during construction. And the third drive will be, will be right in, right out only. Uh, so the business operation, as well as the operation of the property, will be substantially impacted during the project, as well as beyond the project. Um, in terms of customers that decide that they no longer want to go to this particular gas station, but the one across the street, or the C store across the street, there's going to be substantial impact to the property and business both short-term and long-term. Uh, and there's really no way to mitigate against that. So we believe that the private entry um, is to, to the property business owner is it outweighs the replacement of this uh, this, this uh, drainage culvert uh, box drain. Uh, and then the third issue I wanted to raise uh, was the, the fact that you know, when you look at impacts to the property, you look at not only the property taken, but the construction and use of the project in the manner proposed. The intersection of PCH and Broadway is already at a failing level of service. I know we're moving from level of service to vehicle miles traveled, but I think under either scenario, it's going to be at a failing level. And during construction, it's proposed that only one lane in each direction be available, uh, and that's assuming the best case scenario. Uh, with, an, with an intersection that is already at a failing level of service, further impacting the streets and the intersection there will not only create issues for my client, but create issues for the general public, um, as well as the city of Laguna Beach. So uh, based upon those three points, as well as all of the information and objections I've raised in my two prior letters, uh, we, would request, we would request that the CTC not approve the resolution at this time. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Uh, uh, Kukowski. Sorry, um, I'm butchering that. Um, I would ask uh, it, for a response from either Caltrans or uh, CTC staff. Okay, and uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, Mike Whiteside, the Assistant Chief Engineer from Caltrans, it has prepared a presentation regarding this. So. I think we're teeing it up, and um, Mike is ready. And I believe you should be able to see my screen now? We do. Okay. Good afternoon, Commissioners. I'm Mike Whiteside, the Caltrans Assistant Chief Engineer. 
The department will request your approval of this resolution so we can proceed with a bridge preservation project on State Route 1, District 12, Orange County. Parcels owned by the Bob Allen Family Trust. Sites approved with a main market and a gas station. And this is the only parcel needed for the project. So the project is located right now on Laguna Beach. Route 1 is an important multifunctional route with countrywide significance connecting all the coastal communities. Uh, it serves the communities as well as commerce and tourists. Uh, this project received a CEQA categorical exemption and a NEPA determination of no significant impact in November of 2018. So this project really is only a few yards wide and long and the subject parcel is located on the north side. Uh, it's the only parcel needed for the project. The parcel is 0.29 acres and then it's approved with a gas station and mini market. So uh, while we're calling this a bridge preservation project, it's actually a replacement project. Uh, there is a 100-year-old culvert running under the highway in this area. So the department is concerned that during a heavy rain, there could be a failure of that culvert. Uh, the project is the department's opportunity to replace the culvert quickly and in a controlled manner that allows for profit during construction. We do have a very limited construction window. In partnership with the city of Laguna Beach, we've agreed to not begin construction until after Labor Day. And uh, we need to be done before the first day of the rainy season, which is October 5th. So we're anticipating 28 days of construction broken into two stages, 14 days each. So as far as the need for the project, I think uh, this, these pictures speak a thousand words. Uh, a failure of this culvert, which is about 100 years old, would not only be a public hazard, but likely cause flooding of the downtown area, forcing the closure of the highway, creating severe congestion in downtown Laguna Beach, and emergency repairs would likely take months. So, in the project area, State Route 1 is the four lane conventional highway. The beach is on the south side, which is uh, on the generally kind of the left side and there are commercial developments on the north side, including the subject parts. Uh, the orange line you see is the Laguna Cal Canyon culvert. It's a subterranean facility generally owned by the city, but the state owns, owns the portion uh, under the state highway. And the culvert runs directly underneath the subject parcel. Uh, now the city is working to repair or replace their portions of the project, but the state owns this portion, now shown in blue, that is under the state highway, and we're proposing to replace it. So zooming in a little bit closer, uh, there was some discussion about driveways. This has been given some critical consideration. All the driveways are within the state right of way, and there are three of them. Driveway one is directly in the path of the construction. That will have to be closed during the construction. Driveway two, it is outside the construction area, but will be what's called the contractor staging area, and I'll discuss that a little bit more. The department is proposing using that generally during construction, although there are uh, opportunities to open it for certain uh, activities, such as fuel delivery, if required, and scheduled in advance. Driveway 3 is around the corner on State Route 133. Uh, that one will be open completely during construction. So the department's not seeking to acquire any land from this parcel. What we're seeking is simply a 400, temp square, 400 square foot temporary construction easement. Uh, that's needed to access high into the city portion of the old culvert. It's needed for safety to barricade the site off to prevent anybody from falling into excavations and for movement of workers, materials, and equipment. We've taken several aggressive measures to minimize the impacts, not just to this property owner, but also to uh, uh, the public in general. We have a very aggressive schedule of uh, 28 days. We're staging the construction uh, into two stages. We're anticipating each in about two weeks. We're working 24 hours a day, seven days a week. We're including incentives and disincentive clauses in the contract to encourage early completion. Uh, we're using precast concrete sections. And we're using shoring to minimize the excavations required. Uh, so, other disruptions to businesses during the construction are considered part of the compensation package. 
So let me show you what we're doing here on the ground level. Uh, you'll notice a red line there. Everything this side or our side of the of the red line is the right of way, and then of course on the other side is the parcel. So what we the contractor will do is establish the temporary construction easement. This picture doesn't show the fencing or barricades that we put into place. Next, we would place shoring and others the old culvert. We would then create a working area around the culvert to allow room for workers and uh, equipment and materials. We will remove the old culvert. We will replace it with a precast concrete culvert, and then we will restore the area to its previous condition. Um, I'd like to take a minute and discuss the yeah, staging sure. of the of the project. Um, first, we'll place barriers along the whole block to uh, allow the contractor room to work. Uh, note that the uh, contractor staging area is the entire block. This will also impact the cinemas and the shops that take the piece of the parcel. Uh, driveway 1, you'll notice, is in the construction area, uh, and that will be torn up and be inaccessible. Driveway 2 is in the contractor staging area and will generally be closed. Uh, that's to ensure contractor safety as well as that of the traveling public. Uh, the last thing you want is an unexpected dirt vehicle to drive into a construction. This area will be used for equipment, for delivery and stockpiling of materials, and for maintaining a safe distance by traffic. Uh, attempting to keep the second driveway, driveway to open any amount of time would really put the construction schedule at further risk. Uh, driveway 3 will remain open at all times. And this stage is only about two weeks. And here we have our staging, our, our, our construction equipment. Mike, can I interrupt you? Can, can you, can you, yes, okay, we, this has all been a part of the commissioner's package. Could you specifically address the four issues that are before the commission that the public interest and necessary necessity required the project, proposed project? Can you just and, and those four the four items that we are under consideration? I, we're familiar with the project. We were briefed on the project, but just kind of shorten it down here uh, and just well, we address the four items, please. To a couple of uh, couple of contentions, and I think we'll cover these. Thank you. So uh, the property owner contends that this project disproportionately and negatively impacts uh, these owners, and asks why we don't put equipment in front of the neighboring Laguna Cinemas movie theater instead of the driveway too. The department's response is that the entire block will be a construction working area for equipment, materials, and workers, not just in front of this parcel. We're making every effort to minimize the impact to everyone, these owners as well as the traveling public, by allowing the 24-7 construction, utilizing precast concrete, implementing incentives and disincentives, uh, and using uh, uh, two-stage construction. Next, uh, the property owner contends that Caltrans failed to complete the necessary environmental review. Uh, as I said earlier, we had a CEQA and NEPA clearance in November of 2018. Uh, the property owner contends that the Caltrans is incapable of conducting a fair and legal hearing. The department's response is that the commission conducts the hearings uh, and it passes a resolution or not. The, the department does not conduct hearings. And regarding the, fate, the contention that the department failed to make every effort to negotiate, instead went straight to condemnation, and the department has not made a valid offer, the department's response is that it's the department's policy to meet with owners in person to explain the project and any offers. Uh, in the month prior to our first written offer, we had an agent made, made a cold call to the site. We, in addition, attempted to reach the owners uh, with seven phone calls, two of which were successful. These were all requests to meet with property owners. Uh, they, our requests were not responded to or were put off for months. Um, in an effort to move the project, an offer was made uh, in September of 2019, and since that time, we have continued to reach out to negotiate with over 47 contacts and two in-person meetings. Uh, so the department has made every effort to negotiate and an offer has been made. Um, regarding the latest offer uh, that uh, was uh, apparently 
you are, and we've been told to send. I'll have to defer to uh, District 12 Director Ryan Chamberlain to uh, address the uh, the assertion that uh, an offer was a counter offer was made. Can we put just uh, Ryan Chamberlain on the line? Okay, his, uh, staff, can we get Ryan Chamberlain's line open, please? I don't see that he's on. District, might be under District 12. I District think. 12? Yes. Somebody else's name. I, mean, I, think, it, I think that's how he logged in. Do we have someone else? Yes, he's District 12 Director. Oh, Director. Okay. Got it. Anyway. There it is. Under District 12. Ryan, go ahead. Thank you. I'm assuming I can be here now? Yes, that is correct. Again, District Director Ryan Chamberlain, uh, we have not received any correspondence or counter offers from the property owner or the attorney since September 2nd. That's a good day. Um, a question for uh, Mike Anderson. The culvert that runs under the physical property of the uh, property owner, there is an easement. I would assume that uh, that the culvert preceded the building being constructed. Is that correct? You, uh, that portion of the culvert is owned by the city of Laguna Beach. The city okay. only has and owns the portion under the state route. Okay, thank you for and, the clarification. And yes, the city has some kind of easement. I, I don't know what it is. But they're um, going to be repairing or replacing their portion uh, as part of another project. Is the cinema that's there in the picture, is that cinema up and operating or is it? It currently is not uh, operating, uh, but there is a small like sweet shop bakery, I believe, adjacent that it is. Okay. Are and you... the shops are occupied. Okay. Uh, Commissioner Inman, you have a question? Uh, that was just about, I just want to make sure to point out that the center has been closed for several years. So a question following up on that easement. So if the city has an easement, the temporary construction ask is really of the city's easement? Um, no, we're asking what is this? We're asking from this property owner. I'm not sure what the easement with the city entails. Perhaps Ryan has more details. No, we are asking for the easement from the property owner, not from the city. Okay, but help us understand then if the city holds that easement, they would be involved, right? Okay, so. Commissioner Inman, I'm being told the city owns an easement for underground for their culvert, and we are requesting our easement for temporary construction easement from the property owner, not, not for the city portion, from the underground easement. So on the above ground part. Okay. 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 Is there Mike the Whiteside? Do you have any other anything else you'd like to add? Uh, no, I, I believe that's it. Uh, okay. Uh, we just ask you, we, we ask the commission to approve this resolution so we can get this project done this rainy season. Okay. If we put it off any longer, it's likely it will be pushed into the next uh, rainy season and we would uh, risk having a failure. Okay. There is a motion and a second on the table. Are there any further, further questions or discussion from the commission? Staff, is there anyone who's raising their hand? Is there any member of the public that's raising their hand who wish to as additional speak? Yeah. Chair Van Denneberg, there's no discussion this time. Okay. Um, I, I'll give you one minute, uh, Counselor, to have one last uh, 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 Krolowski. Do you have one minute that you'd like to speak? Can we open his line, please? Okay, you're alive. Yes, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you now. Okay. Uh, well, it's, it's kind of interesting that uh, they say no counter was provided. I provided a counter offer to the state's attorney, who was the one I was actually dealing with on this project um, several weeks ago. 
Um, so I, I don't know if that was not provided to you or not, but it was provided to him along with some of our financial information in order for, you know, to, to, to be a discussion regarding the negotiation aspect of the acquisition. Um, that, as well as the issue of, you know, reviewing the presentation by staff, I think the issue concerning the, the large staging area uh, right in front of our property, uh, which extends, you know, pretty far deep into the property also, which will likely impact pedestrian use, which is a large portion of our business, uh, in addition to the driveways, uh, substantially outweighs uh, the necessity for the replacement of this uh, drainage culvert um, in terms of the impacts to the uh, private injury uh, provision of the eminent domain law. Um, with that, I have nothing to add. Thank you very much, Councillor. All right, is there any other comments from the Commissioner or the public staff? No other comments. Doug, please call the roll. Commissioner Alvarado. Yes. Commissioner Burke. Yes. Commissioner Dunn. Yes. Commissioner Gardino. Yes. Commissioner Inman. Aye. Commissioner Kehoe. Aye. Commissioner Liu. Aye. Commissioner Norton. Aye. Commissioner Tabaloni. Aye. Chair Van Kennenberg. Aye. Chair, we, the motion passes. Thank you. I, item 5, approval of the minutes. Do I have a motion? This is Commissioner Albright. I'd like to make a motion to approve the minutes. Do I have a second? Thank you. I have a motion and a second. Please call the roll. Commissioner Alvarado. Yes. Commissioner Burke. Yes. Commissioner Dunn. Yes. Commissioner Gardino. Yes. Commissioner Inman. Aye. Commissioner Kehoe. Aye. Commissioner Liu. I'm going to abstain. Commissioner Norton. Aye. Commissioner Tabaloni. Aye. Chair of Aye. I'd call for, go ahead, Doug, and you. Chair, the motion passes. Thank you. Uh, to, uh, would call on uh, Executive Director Mitch Weiss to give his report. Good afternoon, Commissioners. Uh, first, I'd like to welcome Commissioner Lude, who is the uh, first commission meeting. Uh, hopefully, one of the next couple ones will actually be able to do one in person. Uh, second, I'd like to notify the commissioners of a number of uh, staffing changes. Uh, Kayla GC has been hired as an analyst and will be working on the Congested Corridors program. Kayla is a Sac State graduate who most re recently worked at Caltrans uh, District 3 in Division of Engineering Services. Zach Taylor joined the commission in March as uh, an analyst assisting in the Local Streets and Roads program. Uh, prior to joining the Commission, he served in the U.S. Navy as a Surface Warfare Officer and most recently was an analyst at the State Controller's Office. We brought on a new assistant, Hote Vu, who will help with website accessibility. He'll be replacing Tyler Liu, who just graduated. Additionally, Celeste Sivas, formerly a student assistant, has been hired as an analyst working on the Local Streets and Roads program. I'd also like to update the commissioners on a couple of recent recent events. On February 11th, I, along with Secretary Kim and Director Omashakan and others, testified at the Senate Transportation Committee uh, in an informational hearing on Senate Bill 1. The hearing was focused on transparency and accountability and ensuring that the public, that SB1 funds are being spent efficiently and consistently with statute. A road charge technical advisory committee was held on February 21st. The committee received an update from Secretary Kim and Caltrans staff regarding next steps and on continued research for the road charge program. The secretary expects to have a more thorough plan for moving forward on road charge by this fall. 
I'd like to update the commissioners on a number of up upcoming events. As you know, the Northern California shop hearing that was scheduled for April 1st is now uh, a part of this agenda. There are uh, several events that were scheduled for April that have been postponed. The Tulare Town Hall and the joint meeting with CARB and HCD. Uh, I ask that the commissioners hold open the April 29th date, which is what we had scheduled for the joint meeting. Uh, we anticipate that we may need this time to discuss other issues. Uh, these internet meetings uh, may be the way that we have to do business for several months. If we can coordinate calendars, there's an opportunity for us to hold more frequent short meetings to address specific issues that arise. We'll be reaching out to you to coordinate and block off time on your calendars. Given this uh, challenging and dynamic climate we're in, I recommend under this item that the commission delegate to me authority to revise the commission's schedule as needed uh, based on changes that, that are occurring and, and our, our capabilities or items that uh, come up that we need to hear on a uh, relatively short notice. I'd also like to update the commissioner on a couple of commissioners on a couple other items. Caltrans has fallen worker memorial that had been scheduled for April 30th will be postponed and the Tri-State Commission meeting that had been scheduled for July has been canceled. As you know, today's meeting is the first meeting we are conducting completely online. Uh, I want to thank our team for putting this together, particularly Doug, Alika, and Justin. And I'd also like to thank commissioners, staff, Caltrans, and our partners for their assistance and their patience as we continue to do business as uh, usual during these challenging times. To help make this meeting, our first meeting online, run more smoothly, we've placed more items on the info and consent calendar than usual. And on the second half of the agenda, we'll be grouping items when making presentations. We've also removed from the agenda a handful of reports that are typically on your agenda. I'd like to brief, briefly pass on some thoughts that were shared to me by a couple of our usual presenters. Uh, from Secretary Kim, CalSTA is focused on coordinating the state's transportation responses to the COVID-19 emergency. He has briefed Governor Newsom on the status of the state transportation system and is providing daily updates to the cabinet level unified coordination group. One of his top priorities is making sure the state highway system remains open and accessible, particularly near hospitals, public labs, and testing sites. Keeping the system functional is also important from a standpoint of freight, and goods movement and is especially important in times of crisis when there is a heightened awareness of the supply chains and what it means to the lives of everyday families. The secretary and his team have been in touch with our partners in the transit trucking and port industries to hear directly from them on what steps they can take operationally and regulatorily to maintain a healthy workforce and head off disruptions to the supply chain. Caltrans Director Omashakan has asked me to relay that in response to the challenges posed by COVID-19, Caltrans is continuing their unwavering commitment to providing the public with a safe and reliable transportation system. Caltrans is maintaining all critical functions during this crisis, understanding the heightened importance of providing dependable access to medical facilities and convenient transport of essential goods and services throughout the state. To that end, ongoing construction and maintenance projects vital to a fully functioning transportation system are currently moving forward without interruption. I'd now like to address several issues that we're dealing with as a result of uh, the COVID-19 crisis. Uh, first on our agenda today are the adoption of three program guidelines. We recognize that in the current environment, we need to revisit these schedules. We'll be recommending you adopt the guidelines today with direction to staff to return in May with updated program schedules. On a related issue, we recognize the impact the current crisis uh, and the restrictions on meetings is having on the ability of cities and counties to meet deadlines in the Commission's Local Streets and Roads program guidelines. Specifically, the guidelines require cities and counties submit to the Commission by May 1st an adopted list of projects proposed to be funded in the program. Staff is working uh, perhaps to schedule a short meeting on April 29th to consider revising the schedule. We'll continue working with our partners to explore options because we want to make sure that everybody uh, receives their funding and we recognize the challenges they're having in holding meetings. Uh, lastly, we recognize there are, there are a number of impacts to our timely use of funds requirements. 
Most agencies are not geared up to work remotely for any extended period of time. Even if the order to stay at home only lasts a short time, there will likely be project delivery delays that will have a domino effect on future projects. We're committed to working with local agencies and Caltrans on this issue. We intend to bring in May a proposal to update the Commission's timely use of funds policies in light of the current situation. Today, we'll be recommending that construction allocations be given 12 months to award contracts rather than the usual six, and we have pulled some time extensions that did not require immediate committed commission action. On other time extensions, we'll be recommending they be deferred. Uh, that concludes my report. I recommend that uh, commission delegate the authority to make calendar changes. Okay. Um, so th this was noticed as an action item. So um, uh, I need a motion that would uh, empower the executive director to make calendar changes on behalf of the commission. I can make the motion, Kehoe. Kehoe makes a motion. Do I have a second? Second. Burke. Burke made a second. Doug, would you please call the roll? Commissioner Alvarado. Yes. Commissioner Burke. Aye. Commissioner Dunn. Aye. Commissioner Gordino. Aye. Commissioner Inman. Aye. Commissioner Kehoe. Aye. Commissioner Liu. Aye. Commissioner Norton. Aye. Commissioner Tabaloni. Aye. Chair of Major Edinburgh. Aye. Chair, the motion passes. You have great power now. Yes. You must use it wisely. All right, under commission reports, um, I'll start. Uh, I want to thank uh, Commissioner Inman for her service as chair. I can only hope to live up to the time and effort she put into being the chair. And when we have, uh, we'll have a more formal appreciation for her uh, <laughs> next time we gather together in person. So I apologize that we can't celebrate you in person today. Uh, welcome, Commissioner Liu, our, our, our newly appointed Assembly uh, Commissioner. Uh, we are looking forward to having your voice and insights on the CTC, so welcome. Um, I wish to acknowledge that this is Director Weiss's first meeting as Executive Director of Commission. Congratulations on your ascension to the Director position at just the right time that all <laughs> broke loose. Uh, congratulations to Commissioner Norton to, on becoming Vice Chair. And today, I am announcing the following committee assignments. The Aeronautics Committee will be Christine Kehoe and Joseph Tavaloni. The Committee on Mass Trans Transportation will be Hillary Norton, Yvonne Burke, and Carl Guardino. The Committee on Streets and Highways will be Lucy Dunn, Bob Alvarado, and Joseph Tavaloni. The Planning Committee will be Yvonne Burke, Fran Inman, and Joseph Liu. The Active Transportation Committee will be Carl Guardino and Joseph Liu. And it, the chair of the Road Charge Technical Advisory Committee will be Lucy Dunn. Uh, the chair attended the Ashto Winter Briefing in Washington, D.C. in February, along with Secretary Kim, Director Omashakin, and Director Weiss. We met with key members of the House and Senate to discuss California's federal surface transportation reauthorization principles. And I learned two very important things. Secretary Kim knows everybody in D.C. I mean everybody. So you have to stop and talk to everybody that he knows. And everybody wants a picture with Director Amushake. He's very much in demand to have photos taken with. Um, is there any other uh, reports that any other commissioners would like to make? Seeing no hands raised, we will move on then to item eight, state and federal legislative matters. Paul. Commissioners, item eight is an action item on state and federal legislative matters. Uh, I'll start with a very brief update on the legislative. Um, uh, on March 16th, the legislature passed a concurrent resolution 189 to recess until Monday, April 13th, due to the COVID-19 pandemic. There have not been any announcements yet about what the uh, legislative calendar bill deadlines will be affected by this. The staff staff are recommending the commission adopt the support position on two bills that have been introduced. Both bills would implement recommendations 
Okay, the Commission's 2019 annual report. This bill is Assembly Bill 1992 by Assemblymember Friedman. This bill would require the forecasted impacts of climate change on transportation infrastructure be addressed in the transportation planning document, including California Transportation Plan, Transportation Management Plan, and Regional Transportation Plan. And the second bill staff is recommending supporting is Assembly Bill 2310 by Assembly Member Daly. This bill would appropriate interest earnings and revenues deposited in the road maintenance and rehabilitation account for the shop and maintenance programs. That concludes my remarks. Staff Do I have a motion? I will be moved. Okay. One yes. second. There's been a motion, a second. Doug, please call the roll. Commissioner Alvarado? Yes. Commissioner Burke? Aye. Commissioner Dunn? <laughs> Aye. Commissioner Gardino? Aye. Commissioner Inman? Aye. Commissioner Kehoe? Aye. Commissioner Liu? Aye. Commissioner Norton? Commissioner Cavalloni? Aye. Chair Van Janenberg? Aye. Chair, the motion passes. Thank you. Just a reminder, um, commissioners, please uh, follow along it with the chair's agenda. I believe we just resent that right before the meeting to each one of you. The chair's agenda is what I'm following. So please follow along with uh, the, the agenda along with on that. Thank you. And now we'll go to item nine, Paul. Tab 9 is an action item to adopt the 2021 Active Transportation Fund Estimate. The draft fund estimate was presented at the January Commission meeting. There have been no substantive changes to it since then. A copy of the fund estimate is in your agenda. I will not go through it in detail other than to note that it provides $446 million for programming over the four year period. Staff recommend approval. Do I have a motion? Uh, this is Kehoe. I move the item. Have a one. Second. We have a motion and a second. Uh, please call the roll, Doug. Commissioner Alvarado? Yes. <laughs> Commissioner Burke? Yes. Commissioner Dunn? Yes. Commissioner Gordino? Yes. Commissioner Hitman? Aye. Commissioner Kehoe? Aye. Commissioner Liu? Aye. Commissioner Norton? Aye. Commissioner Tavaloni? Aye. Chair of Lincoln Aye. Chair of the motion passes. Item 10, uh, Garth, we have a presentation on the safe vehicle rules update. Yes, Commissioners, Tab 10 is an information item. It's been a while since uh, we have received an update on the safe rule. There have been some developments, and so we have invited Vince Lomato from FHWA, Tanisha Taylor from Calcog, and Marlon Florinley from Caltrans to provide you with an update. And with that, I'll turn it over to Vince Lomato first. Hi, everybody. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. All right, great. Uh, so, Vince Lamont, Division Administrator of the Federal Highway Administration here in California. Uh, afternoon, everybody. Nice flexibility and nimbleness you all are showing by being able to do this uh, remotely. Uh, on March 10th, if you're talking about the safe rule, that was the EPA and NHTSA rule that was addressing emissions and uh, removed the waiver uh, that California had. Uh, and on March 10th, I sent a letter in conjunction with Ray Tellis from Federal Transit Administration to the Regional Administrator for uh, EPA uh, requesting some direction on our 27th, what model we need to be using. I received a letter 12 days later, they were on fire. Um, so the EPA Regional Administrator has uh, given us direction on using MFAT 
2017 and MPAC 2014 through that grace period for MPAC 2017. Uh, they also address the uh, off-model adjustment factors that California Air Resources Board uh, had used for the model uh, and have accepted those adjustment factors also. Um, so what this does is it allows us to move forward with conformity determinations in California again. I know SCAG's got a plan coming here, uh, coming to Federal Highway and, Cal and Caltrans shortly. Uh, next month, I believe, uh, and also it allows us to do to approve modifications to the FSIP and the FTIP um, modifications that require uh, conformity analysis, which was the, the thing we've been holding off, off on until we got this direction. So uh, I want to give out a particular thanks uh, for the effort that was made in the coordination uh, Elizabeth Adams from EPA Region 9 uh, did incredible work to try and get this get this through. Um, Dr. Stephen Cliff from California Air Resources Board and Kurt Carperos um, also from the California Air Resources Board. They all of them took an, a, an approach to look at this mechanically um, and not 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 deal with the the policy part of it, but this is just the mechanics of how do we have a model that accommodates safe rule part one, um, and they were able to get a, a huge quick turnaround on this, so we were able to move forward with conformity analysis as it pertains to part one. Um, part two is still coming. Um, I'll let our other two panel speakers talk about how we address part two as that comes along. That's all I have if there's any questions. Thank you. Tanisha? Thank you. Hopefully everyone can hear me. I, so first, uh, obviously, I usually come with back and, and then this came out as a bit of good news. Uh, but I want to say thanks to the collaborative efforts between our state, federal, and regional partners. And you, you heard Ben say on March 12th, you gave the right guidance to love FA3 and FCA to begin. Uh, approving those conformity determinations, which is great news for us. So what exactly does that mean? Uh, this means that it seems like GAGs are in the process of stating their regional transportation plan may receive federal approval. Uh, this allows projects in the new plan to move forward to the project delivery process, which is a concern for March 12th. It also allows projects like the Valley Link Trust in Hamilton County to provide new rail service connecting Hamilton County with BART to move forward as well. Uh, prior to the 12, FHWA and FTA did not have the ability to approve conformity determinations for these activities, and so now they can move forward. Um, that's great news. Uh, these regions and others requiring amendments that require use of MPAC are encouraged to submit them ASAP, and then said I would talk about part two, um, and I'll talk about the uncertainty that comes with part two, and so now to that uncertainty. Um, although I believe this date will be delayed due to the current focus of the federal government in fighting the COVID-19 pandemic, the Federal Office of Management and Budget's website currently indicates we should anticipate safe rule part two to be finalized by April 1st. And again, I do anticipate that to be delayed uh, based on our current focus in fighting the pandemic and our priority there, which is appropriate. Um, once finalized, it is unclear what the future looks like. It is possible that we can be similar to the space with the roll of a safe rule part one, we won't know until the rule is published. However, we're hopeful that the work that Ben and his team have done along with EPA, uh, maybe President Fetty and May, uh, help us move forward quickly with part two. Although it's unsure and it's too early to tell if that's the case. So what are we doing? Council is working with Senator Bell's office on SB 1291 to remove uncertainties around delivery of 2020 FTIP update, uh, which comes in a time where potentially safe pool part two we're still trying to figure out. Uh, this allows regions to continue to deliver their existing tips uh, and uh, provide some certainty to the process. Uh, we continue to coordinate with our state and federal partners in understanding the appropriate next steps. And regions are first to coordinate the approval of any amendments of Caltrans in the California offices of FHWA, FTA, and EPA. We're also having weekly calls with state agencies to continue to understand those appropriate next steps. So I'm happy to answer any questions that you all may have. Commissioner Liu, I believe, has a question or a comment. Well, that, that, that text and mix thing really works. Um, I do have a question, and that just is 
whether the changes to MFACT uh, to comply with the, the new emission inventory calculations will make it any harder to demonstrate conformity? Um, it will make it harder for the reasons to demonstrate conformity. Um, the way the consistency process works is that we have a budget, uh, which is a, a maximum amount of emissions we can put out. And so by adding more emissions to make cars dirtier, it does make it harder to conform. Okay, thank you. Okay. Um, are there any questions for Tanisha? If not, we'll move to Marlon Flournoy. No, okay. no question or comment at this time. Okay, Marlon Flournoy, would you please make your presentation? Okay, uh, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay, great, thank you. Um, I really appreciate the opportunity to talk to uh, the Commission about the safe role. Um, uh, like uh, Tanisha stated, you know, Caltrans, we really appreciate the opportunity to you know, partner with state agencies, federal agencies, as well as our regional partners to move forward. Um, as you already heard from Vince, uh, the uh, impact adjustment factors um, are approved, and um, and uh, FHW can now move forward with providing the air quality conformity determinations. So with this said, um, Caltrans strongly encourages regional agencies to take advantage of this window of opportunity um, ahead of the safe rule part two coming out uh, to make any um, scope changes to existing projects in their RTPs as well as adding new projects to their RTPs um, that require the use of the impact model. Now the big picture thing I want to really want to convey here is that um, you know we, we have the impacts of the, the COVID-19, much of our workforce is working from home. Uh, but I do want to reassure everyone, our programming staff, to work really safely from home, and they're set up to quickly process a programming request, uh, and you can quickly move those over to FHWA uh, for those air quality determinations. So I just want to make sure that everyone understands that we um, do understand the importance um, of moving these things forward, um, and we want to get those over to FHWA as soon as possible. Uh, so I just want to convey that message. Thank you. And more or less, we think that's next, because Federal Highway is also uh, remote working, but we are actually working. So we can, we're going to be processing all those things just like Caltrans is going to be doing. Okay. Thanks, thanks. Thank you. Are there any questions or comments from the Commission? Okay, seeing none, that was an informational item. Uh, we'll now move to is there anything else, Garth, that you want to wrap up with? No, Commissioner, not at this time. Okay. We'll move to item 11. Uh, Teresa. Commissioners, I don't know if there's any Staff recommendations be made available at least 20 days prior to SNF adoption. On February 28th, staff released this, its recommendations for the 2020 SNF. They were distributed via email and posted on the Commission's website. A hard copy was mailed to each one of the commissioners. The staff recommendations have been crafted to program the capacity available by the estimate. Unstip guidelines that was adopted by the Commission in August 2019. I would like to highlight a few things for the 2020 step. Except for a few projects, all projects proposals, all projects proposed that were part of the RTIPs and ITIPs are included in staff recommendations. It was possible because total proposals were below the capacity identified in the fund estimate. Advances to existing projects were also considered the extent capacity allowed, staff recommended them, except for very few projects that we were unable to accommodate the advancement. For those projects, staff worked with the agencies, or and will continue to work with them, to advance the projects through an AB3090 or a segmenting the project to provide greater flexibility. In the Inter regional program, Staff is recommending programming the State Route 70 passing lanes project segments 4 and 5. This project is proposed by Butte County for interregional shares. This is an important trade project that will be combined with a shop project. 
that was able to accommodate this request because the overall capacity, as mentioned earlier, allowed it. That is not recommending the closed subdivision rail project at this time. Instead, staff recommends a rail reserve for the same amount in the last year of the stair. This will allow Caltrans to fully develop the project's scope, cost, and schedule, and bring the project forward through a skip amendment or in the 2022 step. Since, since the staff recommendations were released, staff has developed a li list of changes and corrections. These are outlined in the attachment B and under attachment B and C under item 12. There is a small capacity remaining the last year of the step. This is mostly to cover cost increases. Therefore, if we are to make any changes, like add or advance one or more projects, we need to have a compensating deletion or delays in the other projects to stay within the fund estimate limits. After adoption of the 2020 step under item 12, there will likely be the need for more technical changes and corrections. As with past steps, the proposed adoption resolution includes a class authorize staff in consultation with Caltrans and regional agencies to make further technical changes with all substantive changes to be brought back to the Commission for approval in May. That concludes my remarks and staff uh, can answer any questions if there are any staff recommendations. Commissioner Kehoe, I believe you have a question. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I just want to bring it to the Commission's attention that uh, and thank you Teresa for the presentation as usual very good uh, Sandag and the CTC staff have been in discussions on options for the I-5 North Coast Corridor improvements in San Diego County uh, that come under this item and uh, the the challenge right now is that the Carlsbad segment is ready early uh, so whatever we can do to facilitate uh, some funding that can be used as soon as possible would be helpful. And of course, I want to recognize that business as usual is completely out the window uh, at this time and maybe for months and months into the future, but that is a complicated project with a lot of heavy equipment on site adjacent to the train tracks and the lagoons. So as much as we can do to uh, keep that project underway, uh, I think it's important for the region. Thanks, Paul. I just wanted to put that on the record. Teresa, right. do you have a comment? I'd love to hear it. Yes. Thank you, Commissioner Kehoe, for your comments. Yes, we recognize that this project is a very important project, and it's uh, pretty much ready. Uh, I, I have been working through the staff development of the STIP. Um, I've been working with the district uh, headquarters as well as the um, the district, uh, Caltrans district offices, and SANDAG to uh, come up with a good solution for the project, and I think we did. Um, we programmed, we, they were able to package the project, to segment, segment the project because it's the CMGC, and so um, when there, there should be some opportunity to advance uh, the first segment uh, if we have delays. So I think it's, we positioned the project really well to continue the project moving. Good. Thank you for your efforts, and thanks to Caltrans as well. I didn't mean to leave them off the list. I know you're all working together. Okay, we have an attendee. Okay, we have an attendee have comment. comment. Yes. Yes. So from Kenneth Cal, Kenneth Cal, items 11, item 12, item 12. MTC would like to thank CTC staff on the preparation of the 2020 STIP and support staff recommendations from Don Batiz. Sandag appreciates the collaboration with CTC staff and Caltrans on this issue. A letter of support was submitted. Thank you. Okay. Are there any other commissioners who are indicating they wish to speak on item 11? If not, that was an informational item. We'll now move to item 12. Teresa. Commissioners, item 12 is an action item. This is the adoption of the 2020 step. In accordance with the earlier discussion and the changes outlined in the revised attachment B and C, staff recommends the commission approve the 2020 step. All right, do I have a motion? Yes. Cavaloni. Yes. Hillary Norton, I move approval of this item. Okay. 
Mo motion by Norton. Is there a second? Second by Alvarado. Second by Alvarado. I'll open it for discussion. There's no public comment this time. There's no public comment. Are there any commissioners who have their hand raised? All right. I'll just say. I'll just state uh, that uh, a big thank you to CTC staff. Uh, the STIP that's presented by staff provides critical funding for high priority projects identified both by the state and regional agencies to meet California's multimodal transportation needs. Uh, this STIP that we are adopting today will fund multimodal transportation improvement projects that will move people and freight more efficiently throughout the state while improving safety and the environment. So thank you staff for working through this. We really appreciate it. And with that, Doug, would you please call the roll? Commissioner Alvarado? Yes. Commissioner Burke? Aye. Commissioner Dunn? Yes. Commissioner Gardino? Yes. Commissioner Inman? Yes. Commissioner Tito? Aye. Commissioner Liu? Aye. Commissioner Norm? Aye. Commissioner Tabaloni? Aye. Chair Mike Trenover. Aye. Chair Motion passes. Thank you. Okay, at this time I will once again remind uh, commissioners and people who are on uh, the phone, please mute your line. If you are not speaking, please mute your line. We are getting feedback in some, uh, in some places, so uh, please mute your line. Okay, at this time we have an informational hearing. Uh, Kevin, Dylan, would you please uh, start the hearing. Thank you, Chairman. Tab 13 is an information item. This item is the required public hearing for the Federal Fiscal Year 2019 Small Urban and Rural Area Federal Transit Administration Section 5310 Enhanced Mobility of Seniors and Individuals with Disabilities Program. This program provides annual grants to purchase transit capital equipment and operational assistance for transit operators to meet the specialized needs of elderly and or disabled person whom mass transportation services are unavailable, insufficient, or inappropriate. The available funding for the 2019 10 program is $14,248,195. The draft 2019 statewide prioritized project list was presented at the January Commission meeting. Since the list was published, the list has been revised to include 11 projects that had been miscategorized in the large urbanized area list. This revision results in two projects falling below the funding level and six projects receiving reduced funding. On February 4th, 2020, Caltrans and Commission staff held the, a, a required appeals hearing, uh, appeals hearing required by statute. Four appeals were submitted by large urbanized area applicants. Applicants were unsuccessful in demonstrating that the conditions adopted program criteria were incorrectly applied in the application review process. The appeals were denied. Staff recommends that prior to adopting the 29th project for the Federal Transit Administration Section 5310 program, the Commission conduct a mandated public hearing and incorporate any changes that are recommended during the public hearing in the final list, uh, final project. And with that, I turn it to you, uh, Chair. All right, at this time, I'll open the hearing. Is there any public comment in this hearing? There's no public comment at this time. Is there any commissioner comment during this hearing? I've been, I've been told that I, people are having a hard time hearing me on the phone, so I will be speaking a little louder. Uh, hopefully you can hear me. Okay, with seeing none, I close the hearing, and we move now to item 14. Kevin. Thank you, commissioners. Tab 14 is an action item. This item is the adoption of the 2019 Small Urban and Rural Area Federal Transit Administration Section 5310 Enhanced Mobility of Seniors and Individuals with Disabilities Transit Program. The revised project list is included in the book item as attachment B, and it programs 100% of the estimated available federal funds for this cycle. If projects are not deliverable or if additional funds above the original estimated amount become available, the next project below the 100% funding level will, uh, shall receive funding. Staff recommends the adoption of the 2019 Small Urban and Rural Area Federal Transit Administration Section 5310 program as presented under attachment B of the book item. All right, is there a motion? 
All right, is there a second? Joe Lee will second. Uh, is there any discussion amongst the commission? Is there any public comment? No public comment. Doug, please call the roll. Commissioner Alvarado? Yes. Commissioner Burke? Yes. Commissioner Dunn? Yes. Commissioner Bordino? Yes. Commissioner Inman? Commissioner Inman? Commissioner Kehoe? Aye. Commissioner Liu? Aye. Commissioner Norton? Aye. Commissioner Tavaloni? Aye. Commissioner Chairman Vandenberg? Aye. And the, as the chair's prerogative, we just got a text from Fran that her audio has cut out, but she's a yes. Thank you. Okay. Chair, the motion is passed. Thank you. Okay, I'm going to, um, just for the record, say one more time to the commissioners, please look at the chair's agenda, and I'll be, I'm going to be more explicit. For this meeting to operate more effectively and smoothly, we, the staff has prepared a list of suggestions who makes motions and seconds. I would, I would advise that every commissioner be looking at that agenda as we move through our meeting today. So if you do not have that agenda in front of you and you're not following along, I would suggest you please do that now. And with that, we'll move to uh, our next public hearing on item 15. Lori Waters, please take it away. Yes, commissioners, tab 15 is a hearing on the 2021 Active Transportation Program Guidelines. Commissioners, the purpose of this hearing is to obtain final public comment on the 2021 Active Transportation Guidelines before adoption. The, the proposed 2021 ATP Guidelines are included as an attachment to tab 16. Correspondence received on the guidelines are included as an attachment to tab 16. The Commission Guidelines are to describe the policy standards, criteria, and procedures for the development, adoption, and management of the Active Transportation Program. Staff brought forward a draft version of the guidelines at the January Commission meeting. Staff has held 19 stakeholder workshops to gather input on the guidelines and the program in general. Many of the workshops were educational forums held in areas of the state that have been less successful in the program. These branch workshops were well received by stakeholders. As this is the fifth active transportation program cycle, stakeholders requested that the program stabilize with limited policy changes each new cycle. Staff has honored this request by keeping guideline revisions mostly to clarifications of existing policy. As discussed at the January Commission meeting, the one major change this cycle is the addition of a quick build project pilot program. Guidance for the 2021 ATP Quick Build Project Pilot Program is included with the guidelines as Appendix D. Because of the current emergency situation, there is one revision to the schedule that staff would like to read into the record at this time. The MPO Regional Guidelines were due to Commission staff by April 17th. Some MPOs cannot meet this deadline because their board meetings have been canceled. The due date will now be moved to May 15th, with the Commission approving these guidelines at the June meeting instead of the May meeting. However, if any of the MPOs want to submit their guidelines by April 17th for adoption at the May meeting, staff can accommodate that as well. In terms of other schedule changes, staff recognizes the current COVID-19 crisis could significantly impact our stakeholders. To address this issue, Staff will reevaluate the current program schedule and bring forward an amended schedule at the May meeting for Commission approval. Also, many potential applicants have expressed concern about the public participation aspect of the ATP application. Some applicants have planned on conducting engagement for their potential project in these last few months to include with their application. However, in-person public engagement should not be conducted at this time. 
To accommodate this situation, staff is re recommending that applicants explain that they had to cancel public engagement sessions due to shelter-in-place requirements. Staff will in turn direct evaluators to not reduce public participation points in these cases. Further, Commissioner Liu has asked staff to consider scoring criteria for active transportation projects to incentivize locating those projects away from freeways and heavily traveled roadways, possibly doing this within the safety criteria. Staff appreciates the suggestion and commits to discussing this with stakeholders for consideration in the next cycle. Before we open the hearing for public comment, I would like to thank all the work group and the technical advisory committee for helping with these guideline revisions. I'd also like to thank Gary Gutierrez and Jaime Espinosa of Caltrans and the Caltrans local assistant staff. And I'm particularly grateful to the Commission's ETP team of Anya Allenbacher, Megan Penderselli, and Lee Changizi. With that, staff recommends opening the hearing for public comment. I now open up the uh, the hearing for public comment. Uh, I'll first ask if there are any questions from the uh, commission, and I know Commissioner Liu has a question. Commissioner Liu. Yes, thank you. Uh, uh, the one issue has been addressed with regard to the scoring criteria. I appreciate the staff's willingness to look at the issue of uh, co locating active transportation projects next to uh, freeways or heavily traveled roadways. There's a distinct public health issue that, that's raised when that happens. And I think we should try to figure out a way to disincentivize it. And also to acknowledge that there may be some communities in which there's no avoiding it. Um, and I will uh, be happy to work with staff on, on those issues. I've already sent them some of the um, health studies that have been done to demonstrate the problem. The other issue I was uh, concerned about, and you know, I'm coming at this with fresh eyes, uh, I, I was really glad to learn that this uh, active transportation program is so popular. But then, of course, very concerned to uh, learn about how oversubscribed it was. And so I uh, asked staff about it, and they explained that there it's, it is possible to fund active transportation projects through many of the other programs that we have. And I would like to ask staff to help identify ways in which uh, this oversubscription problem in the active transportation program can be addressed perhaps by working with local agencies and letting them know that some of their active transportation uh, projects might be able to be funded through other programs and giving them examples of what's been done in the past. So that, that's my request. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, at this time, I'll open. Is there any other questions or clarifications from the commissioners? Mm -hmm. Seeing none, I'll now open the hearing for public comment. Yes, we have one uh, written comment from Linda uh, Komishin, followed by Jonathan Matz, who currently has his hand raised. Linda with California Bicycle Coalition uh, states, I want to thank Lori and her team for all their hard work and diligence to gather feedback from stakeholders across the state during the guideline development process. Along with our partners, we have submitted formal comments on the guidelines, highlighting our support for provisions and as well as concerns. Happy to hear that there, were, there will be a timeline adjustments to help give communities more time to apply. Looking forward to that announcement. Thank you. Jonathan, uh, we're waiting to open your mic. It appears uh, Jonathan commented that he did not mean to raise his hand. Uh, we do have a written comment from Ken Cow of MTC. They would like to thank CTC staff for their existing extensive outreach on the ATP guidelines. MTC supports staff's proposed examination of scheduled delay due to the COVID-19 and support the guidelines as proposed. Uh, we have another comment from Ryan Snyder, I appreciate the desire to keep physical activity away from freeways. However, these are often the worst places for people to walk and bicycle. We have to cross freeway on off ramps and they need help. Can we not disincentivize these? That's all, thank you. Okay. If there's nothing else, I will close the public hearing. The hearing is now closed. 
And we'll move to item 16. Lori. Commissioners, item 16 is an action item to adopt the 2021 Active Transportation Program Guidelines. Staff would like to add that the, after the guidelines adoption of the 2021 Active Transportation Program, the fifth cycle, the project, the project call for projects will be posted. Staff recommends your approval of the 2021 ATP guidelines as proposed in your attachment and the schedule revision as noted by staff. Move approval. This is Commissioner Gordina. Keno second. There's been a motion and a second. Is there any discussion? Any discussion? Okay. No discussion at this time. Okay, thank, thank you. you. Call the roll, Doug. Commissioner Alvarado. Yes. Commissioner Burke. Yes. Commissioner Dunn. Yes. Commissioner Gardino. Yes. Commissioner Inman. Yes. Commissioner Kehoe. Aye. Commissioner Liu. Aye. Commissioner Norton. Aye. Commissioner Tavaloni. Chair Rankin Edward. Aye. Chair, the motion passes. Thank you. We'll go to item 17. Uh, Lori Waters, please. Commissioners, item 17 is an action item to adopt the 2021 Active Transportation Guidelines Metropolitan Planning Organization competitive component for the Metropolitan Transportation Commission. SB 99 allows the Commission to adopt guidelines proposed by MPOs for administering their MPO competitive component of the ATP. The MPO guidelines must be consistent with state guidelines, but they are allowed discretion in certain areas such as asking for a supplemental call for projects and project selection criteria and weighting. The Metropolitan Transportation Commission is requesting adoption of their guidelines at this meeting so that the release of their regional call for projects could coincide with the state's call for projects. In summary, the Metropolitan Transportation Commission is requesting in their guidelines to conduct a supplemental call for projects, use the region's communities of concern criteria to define disadvantaged communities, and use additional evaluation criteria and weighting. Commission staff reviewed MTC's guidelines and found them consistent with the statewide guidelines. Staff recommends adoption of the Metropolitan Transportation Commission's 2021 ATP guidelines. All right. Is there a motion? Commissioner Norton, would you like to uh, Commissioner Norton. Go ahead. Commissioner Norton moves. Commissioner Inman seconds. All right, is there any discussion? Any member of the public who wishes to speak? Uh, we do have public comment, yes. Okay. Uh, Jonathan Matz, written comment. Uh, Safe Routes Partnership is pleased to support the 2020-2021 ATP guidelines. As usual, CTC staff went above and beyond in seeking input from all corners of the state and every category of stakeholder. Last week, we submitted with other partners in advocacy a letter detailing suggestions about specific aspects of the guidelines. From Patricia Chen of LA Metro, LA Metro would like to express support for the guidelines. Extensive outreach was conducted and many issues settled. We would like, we'd still like to see a future effort to resolve outstanding issues with standard statewide disadvantaged community definitions so that regional definitions are not needed. Thank you very much. Okay, Mitch, is there anything? Oh, I, I just wanted to note that I think those two, the last two comments were for the previous item, not this particular item. Okay, okay well, we, those, those two uh, commenters can clarify if they want their comments to be in the record for the previous item, and they can follow up with a written. Okay. okay, there is a motion, a second on the floor. Is there any more discussion? If there's none, Doug, please call the roll. <clears throat> Commissioner Alvarado. Yes. Commissioner Burke? Yes. Commissioner Dunn? Yes. Commissioner Gordino? Yes. Commissioner Inman? Aye. Commissioner Kehoe? Aye. Commissioner Liu? Aye. Commissioner Norton?
Commissioner Norton. Commissioner Tavoloni. Aye. Commissioner Tavoloni. Aye. Chair Bay Commander. Aye. Chair, the motion passes. Thank you. Item 18, uh, hearing for the 2020 Local Partnership Program, Christine Gordon. Good afternoon, Commissioner. The purpose of this hearing is to obtain final public comment on the 2020 Local Partnership Program guidelines before adoption. The proposed 2020 Local Partnership Program guidelines are included as an attachment to tab 19. Correspondence received on the, on the guidelines are included as an attachment to tab 19 and as a pink item provided today. The commission guidelines are to describe the policy, standards, criteria, procedures for the development, adoption, and management of the Local Partnership Program. That brought forth a draft version of the guidelines at the January Commission meeting. BAP has held eight workshops to hear discussions on the guidelines. The last workshop was held on February 14th. At the January Commission meeting, staff reviewed the major key policy revisions to the guidelines. Since the January meeting, there have been a few other revisions to the guidelines that include the following. First, to clarify when eligible taxing authorities that receive voter approval of new tax measures, tolls, or fees after the adoption of the formulaic funding will receive formulaic program funding. Second, to clarify matching requirements for sound wall only projects. And lastly, to clarify the allocation adjustment process for formulaic program projects. In terms of the program schedule, staff recognizes the current COVID-19 crisis could significantly impact our stakeholders. To address this issue, staff will reevaluate the current program schedule and bring forward an amended schedule at the May meeting for commission approval. Staff recommends that the commission consider adopting the project nomination for the 2020 Local Partnership Formulaic Program of Projects on a case-by-case -case basis in advance of the deadline listed in the 2020 Local Partnership Program Guidelines. This will give agencies the flexibility to start implementing projects when they are ready. That concludes my remarks. Unless you have any questions for staff, staff recommends the chair open the hearing for public comment. Um, before I open the, the, um, the hearing, I, uh, Commissioner Liu, you have a question? Uh, actually, a, a recommendation. I noticed the uh, under the list of eligible projects that it, it, uh, there was a sentence that said the commission encourages projects that align with the state's climate goals. And I was wondering why that's uh, just something that is encouraged, not required. So I would recommend that staff consider making alignment with the state's climate goals a requirement when these guidelines are amended again. Okay. Thank you, Commissioner Lou, that is well noted. Thank you. At this time, I will open the public hearing for uh, the 2020 Local Partnership Program Guidelines. The hearing is now open. Staff, do we have anyone who wishes to comment, both in, either in writing or verbally? Okay, I'm looking around seeing none. I will now close the hearing. And move to item 19, adoption of the 2020 Local Partnership Program Guidelines, Christine Gordon. Commissioner, tab 19 is an action item to adopt the 2020 Local Partnership Program Guidelines. Prior to making my recommendation, staff would like to take this opportunity to thank all our stakeholders that participated in all the workshops, including all the regions, Caltrans, California Air Resources Board, and Department of Housing and Community Development. I also would like to recognize Laura Penny Baker for her contribution in the development of the performance metrics that are part of the guidelines. This will provide the data we need to tell the story of the great projects receiving funding for this program. Thank you to all the programming teams. Staff would like to add that after guidelines adoption, the 2020 Local Partnership Program call for projects will be posted. Staff recommends that you adopt the 2020 Local Partnership Program Guidelines as proposed in your attachment and the schedule recommendations for the formulaic program as noted by staff. 
staff also re recommends to authorize staff to make technical and non substantive changes as needed to the guidelines. All right, is there a motion? Is there a second? All right, is there a discussion amongst the, the commissioners? All right, I would just uh, add uh, that we recognize that what we're adopting today is a compromise. And this was a long journey to get here. I want to thank all the parties who engaged in discussions, and I want to thank staff who really worked hard to find a workable solution. I want to especially thank our self-help counties. I want to once again recognize that you bring $5 billion annually dedicated transportation infrastructure and mobility to the table in California. And you represent 25 very diverse expenditure plans and all are accountable to the voters. So I want to thank you for what you do and thank you for being, uh, for being patient during this journey. And with that, is there any other comments, public or from, or from the commission? No call the roll, Doug. Commissioner Alvarado? Yes. Commissioner Burke? Yes. Commissioner Dunn? Yes. Commissioner Gordino? Yes. Commissioner Inman? Aye. Commissioner Kehoe? Aye. Commissioner Liu? Aye. Commissioner Norton? Aye. Commissioner Tavaloni? Aye. Chair Rankin Edward. Aye. Chair, the motion passes. Thank you. Item 20, Christine. Tab 20 is an action item to adopt the 2020 Local Partnership Formulaic Program funding distribution. The 2020 Local Partnership Formulaic Program is funded from $108 million annually in state funds authorized by Senate Bill 1 that are appropriated from the road maintenance and rehabilitation account for fiscal years 2021 through 2022-23. Only agencies with commission adopted funding and committed local matching funds are eligible to receive formulaic funding. On January 24, 2020, staff published the draft 2020 local partnership formulaic program proposed funding distribution, which outlined the proposed funding for taxing authorities, authorities previously determined by staff to be eligible for the local partnership formulaic program. Staff solicited feedback to ensure affected and potentially eligible jurisdictions had an opportunity to review, comment, request modification, and submit information to verify eligibility prior to the March 25th 2020 commission meeting. Based on the most current population and revenue data available and feedback received from affected and potentially eligible jurisdictions, staff revised the formulated funding distribution for 43 eligible agencies. One additional agency was deemed eligible to be incorporated into this programming cycle, resulting in a new total of 44 eligible agencies. Staff recommends your approval of the 2020 Local Partnership Formulated Program Funding Distribution as proposed in your attachment. I'll entertain a motion. Move. Move. If I'm Burke, Dunn seconds. I have a motion by your, uh, Burke and a second by Dunn. Um, discussion? Public this comment? Regarding tab 21 from? Uh, we are on tab 20. Okay. There's no comment on tab 20. No comments on tab 20. All right. Any, and I see no commissioner comment. Doug, please call the roll. Commissioner Morano. Yes. Commissioner Burke. Aye. Commissioner Dunn. Yes. Commissioner Gordino. Yes. Commissioner Inman. Aye. Commissioner Kehoe? Aye. Commissioner Liu? Aye. Commissioner Norton? Aye. Commissioner Tavaloni? Aye. Chair Rankin Aye. Chair, the motion passes. Thank you. Uh, 
move to item 21, adoption of the 2020 Trade Quarter Enhancement Program Guidelines. Hannah Walter, would you please review the item? Good afternoon, Commissioner. This is an action item to adopt the 2020 Trade Quarter Enhancement Program Guidelines. I want to thank all the stakeholders who participated in all the workshops that we held uh, while developing these guidelines. Uh, just a couple of things to note about this final version of the guidelines. In regards to the infra language, in the 2018 program, there was language in the guidelines that allowed us to fund projects that were successful in receiving federal infrastructure for rebuilding America or in programs. This is a timing issue and having state funds make these grants which have a great focus more competitive. Originally, staff had removed this language from the 2020 guidelines to protect the competitive nature of the program because funding these projects moves money away from our regular competitive process. However, after further conversations with stakeholders about this, uh, the language is added back in with some changes. So funding is now capped at 50% of the applicable regional board or target. Applicants must fill out and submit an application, and the language allows the commission to consider providing funds for other federal grants rather than just in for us, as long as they demonstrate a significant great benefit. Staff recommends a broader conversation be held to think about this language for future program cycles. Uh, zero emissions infrastructure, there's been a lot of conversation about funding zero emissions infrastructure under the trade order program. Staff realized the importance of alternative fuel sources and supports funding zero emissions infrastructure as long as the projects fall within the intent of the program to improve freight infrastructure. In regards to timing, as has been stated previously, staff will reevaluate the current program schedule and bring forward an amended schedule at the May meeting for commission approval. Staff recommends that you adopt the 2020 trade quarter enhancement program guidelines. And staff also recommends that you authorize staff to make technical non-substantive changes as needed to the guidelines. This concludes my comments. All right. Do I have a motion? Tab will only move it. And one second. All right. I have a motion and a second. I'll open it up for discussion and comments. Commissioner Liu. Thank you, Chair. I, um, I have the, the two issues with uh, the uh, trade tour and national program guidelines that I wanted to raise. The first one having to do with which projects are eligible. And I think it's unfortunate that um, from my conversations with staff at this time, we really lack clarity on the extent of our legal authority to make eligible um, and prioritize funding for zero and near zero emission heavy duty trucks and off-road equipment. Uh, that operate in our trade corridors and I've been told that this is because possibly because of restrictions in Article 19 of the Constitution, California Constitution and you know I've, I've read it and looked at it and it seems to me that we should be able to fund these efforts as part of uh, the provisions that allow for measures to mitigate environmental effects. However, uh, staff has asked for a legal opinion on this and we're still waiting for that to come back and it would have I mean, for me, it would have been preferable to have that opinion before considering these guidelines today. So that was the, the first thing I wanted to raise. The second has to do with uh, my preference to prioritize zero and near zero emission fueling and charging infrastructure programs. Um, and I know I have discovered again in conversations with staff that in order to do so, we might have to address a, a more fundamental problem and that the guidelines are structured in a way such that um, funding environmental mitigation projects in and of themselves may not be possible because they're not an actual eligible project or it has to be tied to some other uh, project, uh, a mitigation measure tied to some other project. And you know, doing so may hamper the construction of zero, near zero emission fueling and charging infrastructure, which is really desperately needed. So. Uh, I'd like staff to consider how these guidelines might be restructured to do that. I understand that it's not possible given this funding cycle, and I, I would have preferred that to happen during this funding cycle because these are long cycles. Um, but I would encourage staff to do that for the next funding cycle based upon uh, what we hear back from the attorney and, and also 
and in consultation with our stakeholders. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Liu. Um, I believe we have uh, some public comment. Yes. So from Patricia Chen on tab 21, LA Metro wishes to express our support for the guidelines and we would especially like to express our thanks for the appropriate inclusion of infra leverage provisions. Uh, also on item 21 from Julia Randolph with the Coalition for Clean Air. I want to thank Hannah and her team for their willingness to receive feedback and work to better the Trade Corridor Enhancement Program. We have submitted formal comments on the guidelines, highlighted our concerns and recommendations, and also would like to voice our support for the demonstrated community support factor within the guidelines. We believe it is important to act on our recommendations before this three-year cycle begins, since this is a $300 million per year funded program and there is no time to wait on protecting our public's health we are excited to continue to partner with the California Transportation Commission to ensure this program protects public health, improves air quality, and prevents climate change. Thank you. Okay, Commissioner Inman. Commissioner Inman, I told you you wanted to speak. Uh, here I am. Yeah, I'm sorry. Um, I just wanted to thank the staff and then point out uh, if anyone ever wondered how important the goods movement sector is stay tuned i've been working 24 7 this weekend to make sure that our sector continues to be able to flow so i think we're going to have to all really come together during this crisis and make sure that we focus on keeping our sector moving so just want to thank for the flexibility. I think we're going to need more flexibility, but it's really tough right now. Thank you. Are there any other comments from commissioners or public? Yes, we have a, a, a member of the public. Yes, we have one public comment from Elizabeth. Elizabeth, you are now unmuted and free to speak. Great, can you hear me? I can, please identify yourself. And your agency. Great. My name is Elizabeth Schultz on behalf of CalSTART, Advanced Energy Economy, and the Union of Concerned Scientists. Thank you for the opportunity to comment on the proposed guidelines for the Trade Corridor Enhancement Program, TCEP guidelines, which determine what products are eligible for $1 billion in funding. We jointly provided a comment letter on the TCEP as we are all focused on the transformation of the transportation and goods movement sectors and therefore support the direction of the state transportation investments into programs that transform the trade sector while improving public health. As stewards of both public investments and public health, we urge you to consider how the state's largest source of transportation funding SB1 funds are used to advance this industry consistent with other state mandates, such as SB350 and SB32. We are very supportive of the inclusion of infrastructure to support zero emission vehicles in the draft guidelines. However, we also ask that you reconsider the staff's decision to exclude any funding for zero emission vehicles or equipment used in the freight sector. We recommend that funding off-road port equipment is certainly in line with the TCEP as we be funding pilot and demonstration projects at freight facilities. Thank you for your time and consideration. Thank you. Is there anything else? Anyone else? Yes, we have one other written comment Great. from Allison Yeo on item 21. Port of Long Beach supports the TCEP guidelines as proposed and thanks the CTC and staff who have demonstrated leadership in continuing to develop this program. We support investments in goods, move, movement efficiency, safety, and sustainability for the state and appreciate efforts to assist us in leveraging federal funding assistance as well. We look forward to continued discussions to advance uh, ZE slash NCE. All right. Thank you. Okay. Anyone else? All right, we have a motion and a second. Doug, would you please call the roll? Commissioner Alvarado. Yes. Commissioner Burke. Aye. Commissioner Dunn. Aye. Commissioner Gordino. Aye. Commissioner Inman. Aye. Commissioner Kehoe. Aye. 
Commissioner Lou. Aye. Commissioner Gordon. Mr. Tabaloni? Aye. Chairman Kennebert? Aye. Chair, the motion passes. All right, thank you. We'll go now to item 22, which is an information item about the Shortline Railroad Improvement Program Guidelines. Don. Yes, thank you, Commissioner. So, tab 22 is an information item to present the draft Shortline Railroad Improvement Program Guidelines. The Shortline Program is a one time competitive program which provides makes available $7.2 million to fund railroad infrastructure projects. Staff has held two public workshops and has worked closely with this class three rail industry to solicit stakeholder input and inform the development of these guidelines. No substantive comments or recommendations have been received to date. Staff will continue to hold additional workshops over the next few months to receive additional input from all of our stakeholders. Per statute, guidelines must be adopted by July 1st, so staff will present the final guidelines at the June 2020 meeting. I would like to note that the performance measures table on page 16 is missing the required air quality metrics, and the table will be corrected in the final version that will come forward at the June meeting. This concludes my presentation of TAP 22, which is an information item, and I would be happy to take any comments or questions. Do we have any comments or questions? No public comment or question at this time. I see no questions. Thank you. We'll move to item 23. Uh, Bridget Driller. Commissioner, tab 23 is an action item. It pertains to the State Water Resources Control Board's draft implementation guidance for the state wetland definition and procedures for discharges of dredged or fill material to waters of the state, referred to henceforth as the procedure. On April 2, 2019, the State Water Board adopted the procedure, which defines what constitutes a wetland, if a wetland is a water of the state, and procedures for related permitting requirements. The State Water Board has been working to develop these procedures since 2007, and the Commission has been engaged in this effort providing comments to the State Water Board in 2016 and 2019. The procedures become effective on May 28, 2020. The State Water Board is in the process of finalizing implementation guidance to ensure that the procedures are applied clearly and consistently across the nine regional water boards. The State Water Board released their draft implementation guidance on February 14, 2020. They have held two public stakeholder meetings on the guidance and solicited stakeholder comments through March 13th. Commission staff has held several meetings with Caltrans as well as with regional transportation planning agencies to understand their questions and concerns regarding the draft implementation guidance. Caltrans submitted technical comments to the State Water Board regarding the guidance in their letter dated March 11th, 2020 which is included in your book item as attachment B. Staff has prepared draft comments included in attachment A of the book item. Our comments support Caltrans technical comments and encourage the State Water Board and Caltrans to continue working together to finalize a memorandum of understanding. The finalization of this agreement will be critical to minimizing the impact of the procedures on the cost and delivery of transportation projects. Staff recommends the Commission approved the attached letter for submission to the State Water Board. Paul Hahn, Chief of Water Units and Wetlands at the State Water Board, and Phil Stolarski, Caltrans Division Chief of Environmental Analysis, are on the phone and can answer any questions you may have on this item. Thank you, Bridget. Uh, do I have a motion for this item? Yes, Dan moves the item. And a second? Second. I have a motion by Dunn, a second by Burke, open for discussion. Um, Commissioner Inman. Commissioner Inman. I understand you want to speak, Commissioner Inman. Okay, are there any uh, members of the public who wish to speak on this item? There's no public comment at this time. Okay. Are there any other commissioners who wish to speak on this item? Do you want to call 
call Commissioner Inman again. She's having audio problems. Commissioner Inman is having audio problems. Um, take a break and come back to it. Uh, we'll take a five minute bathroom break because we were going to take a break at three o'clock anyway. We'll see if we can fix Commissioner uh, Inman's um, microphone issue. And so you have a five minute break to uh, for comfort break. And we'll come back with this item being an open item at the moment. Tap on 23. 